summers I just sat and rocked in a rocking chair on the porch and read books, and that's all I did all summer. And when I turned 13, my mother said I had to get a job. Uh, actually, I think she was very wise to do that. So I got a job, but then she also decided after my play, this musical was done, uh, that she went to the locals, uh, what is it called? Uh, basically amateur adult theater group. Uh, at, but they had community theater, yes. But they had a beautiful 50 seat theater with lights and was, and she talked them into letting us put on my play there. And, um, and originally I directed it, even though I was 14, maybe 15, confused, but not 14, I think. Um, but then my uncle, who had theater experience, came back to town, and so he directed the second half of it. But in any case, I cast myself in the supporting role of the, uh, anyways, the supporting role. And um, I must say, I loved <laughs> the supporting role because he had, he had one scene, excuse me, one song, maybe two scenes, but he had one, one song. And I had a lot of time off stage, which it let me enjoy the whole experience. So I didn't have the, anyway, I'm sorry if I keep going this way. It's too long of a version. But um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I was in my place in high school. Then in college, I, I uh, didn't do any of my, well, no, I did one of my Then I went into depression, and I kept uh, auditioning for plays and not getting in them. And so then when I got in as a playwright to Yale School of Drama, I thought, well, surely I will not do any acting here because it, it's, uh, a, there are actors here who are, who are planning to do it professionally, and I couldn't even get cast in college. So uh, then weirdly, because of the Yale Cabaret, I ended up being in all sorts of plays that I, because they needed uh, as many, the actors were so busy, they needed, needed as many non-acting major people to be in the cabaret. So I ended up doing that. And I, I loved actually being in a place that I didn't write, and it gave me a lot of experience in terms of A, acting, and B, knowing what actors needed mm -hmm. from the playwright. Because sometimes we'd be in a play that I didn't write, and, and we would find the same part. So we, we, you know, we'd discuss how to do it with the sometimes among ourselves. And um, then, then I, I, it's weird, I, I took a, <laughs> um, I was the only playwright who asked to take the singing class with the actors. And so uh, I did that, and Sigourney Weaver was in my class with me. And um, uh, we put on a show at the cabaret at the end of the year where we just, we, we did singing. And um, uh, Sigourney and I did a number together that uh, was funny, and a few years later, we ended up doing a cabaret show together in New York because of it. But in any case, because I was in this, uh, in this cabaret, um, Robert Brustein had decided to do this co-authored uh, show called The Idiot's Karamazov, and Alyosha the Monk, it was, uh, well, to drop a big name, Meryl Streep, as a student, was playing Constance Garnett, who was the main character, and she was the 80-year-old crazy translator. And she was supposedly translating the Brothers Karamazov, but she was mixing it up with Chekhov and uh, <laughs> uh, Long Day's Journey Into Night. And Alyosha, in this version, oh, and, and also Anais Nin was in it, who was <laughs> an obsession of my co-author, Albert Inarado. In I didn't even know who Albert uh, Anais Nin was. But Anais Nin became obsessed with Alyosha the monk, who's actually from the Brothers Karamazov, and she turned him into a pop star. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I ended up being cast in the actual production as the pop star Alyosha, who got to sing the rock song Everything's Permitted, which is something that Ivan Karamazov talks about in the Brothers Karamazov. So I'm going to just shut up and say from, <laughs> time, from time to time I was in my own place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was not, I, I replaced, when, when the actor, in the actors, I was good casting for the actor's nightmare, but we didn't think it was a great idea for me to be in Sister Mary somehow. It was just too, I don't know, uh, sort of the author shouldn't be in that play. Um, and there wasn't a me character, but um, uh, 
the main act, after the play had been running for about a year, the main actor took uh, a two week vacation and I got to play the actor in the actor's nightmare. And it was uh, yeah. wonderful fun. And then I, w I just want to say this one thing and then I'll show you. Uh, that a year later, or six months later, Nancy Marchand was now playing Sister Mary. And, um, and a few of the other actors were now new because the uh, other ones had left after a year of their own volition. Uh, and um, uh, the same actor had to take a vacation, but his understudy wanted to go to a wedding. And so he said, could Chris take over for this weekend? And I was fine with it, but the other, the actors said, we're willing to do it as long as we don't have to have a rehearsal. <laughs> so I did the actor's nightmare, which is about this person who's never been to rehearsal, <laughs> uh, with uh, Nancy Marchand and other uh, other actors without a rehearsal. And actually, it was great fun. <laughs> I, must, I must say, I knew the lines great. well. <laughs> and Leslie, um, I had the pleasure of seeing you do high dive here um, for City Theater. Um, so I maybe that's the great starting point for you to talk about acting in your own work? Um, yeah, I wrote High Dive about, it was about turning 50. So um, by then I already had, I mean, I came at things um, very differently than Chris. In fact, I auditioned for Yale and didn't get in. And there are times now when I still think about my acting audition at Yale and I just hang my head. I, I really didn't know anything about it. I came out of college, not particularly well trained, becoming a theater major at the very last minute. I, I didn't really have any kind of tool set. And I went right into VISTA, which is Volunteers in Service to America. And I was in the ghetto in Ohio teaching theater to kids in a very isolated, and, and it, it sounds noble, but I wasn't good at it. <laughs> and it was, I mean, I did try hard, and we did do plays, but I never understood really what the point was. And then I came out of that and, um, and, and moved to New York with a lot of vigor and passion and just not a lot of skills, and I didn't have a community. I, that's the problem with not going to a conservatory or a graduate school where you come out knowing people. So I arrived in New York very much a maverick and very alone. And I, I really started being in my own stuff purely out of desperation. I didn't have any other way of doing it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't have anyone to call. I had no community. So the very first thing I wrote when I arrived in New York, not thinking I was a writer, um, was a play called Footlights, which I actually think I talked about. Did I talk about yeah. it? Um, where I, I did 12 different characters, and I changed from character to character only by changing my shoes. <laughs> so the only thing that was on stage was shoes. And the whole play went from the, from the floor up. You know, as my posture changed, the character changed. And, and then I got an agent, and then I, I moved along. But it, it, it is how I started, that I wrote for myself. And once I did that, I, I wrote for myself a lot mm -hmm. um, because I, I can do it. I, I know how to write for myself. So there were other things that I did along the way. And then when I was turning 50, I had this experience of trying to jump off the high dive board for a whole week. And I, I could never actually jump off the board. So um, I wrote that play that was a really different play because the audience was given scripts and they had to read lines to me while I stood on the high dive. It worked so well. Thank you. It was funny and it was risky. It was a risky thing to do and I really enjoyed it. So actually now we're at a point, there have been other one acts that I've done since then like Plan Day and 24 Years in Place that you know. Mm -hmm. um, but now I'm, I'm in a position where I've just written a play about turning 60. And, and this isn't a solo play. And um, as I was writing it, I was trying to pretend that I wasn't writing it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really was trying to pretend that. I was thinking, no, no, I'll just sit in the back. But it, it, it's definitely, you know, so when, I, when it came time to give it to other actors to read, and I did a couple of uh, readings of it at the Manhattan Theater Club and had some good actors read the role and I got a lot out of that and, that, and I knew that it was really my role, mm -hmm. that I really did want to do it. And so I, I have to say that uh, 
it, it is now, we now actually just got a production, and it's it's going to be opening a year from now at Bay Street in Sag Harbor, and I'm in it. Oh, that's so great. I'm, I'm delighted that they've let me go in it. I realize that it's a premiere, and not every director wants to work with the at the playwright mm -hmm. who is also in it. There are there are minuses to that because the playwright isn't available to keep writing. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point you have to stop. It's also the kind of thing, and I've done it. I was in my own play in Pittsburgh called Lovely Day. And, and the actor would be talking to me, and I would say, I'm, I'm going to change that line. <laughs> <laughs> and the actor would be like, <laughs> and I'd just get a piece of paper, and I'd change it and say this, and then I'd say, no, no, don't say it like that, which really, uh -huh. really is so <laughs> That's so awful, so then the actor doesn't like me. You don't have trust of any kind, and it all breaks down. It just breaks down. So um, I am a little nervous. <laughs> about doing this this summer. I have to behave better than that. So I hope that the play is more finished than the one that, that opened in, in Pittsburgh. And I do imagine that if the play, hopefully the play moves, that I won't go with it. That I, I will step out and... What's the title of that? Play? Out of the City. Out of the City. And it is opening Out of the City. <laughs> <laughs> I did see... Uh, an actress here do high dive, and it was so interesting having seen you do it and know that it was so much your story. I mean, a hundred percent your story and your emotions, and then seeing somebody just play. You. I know, isn't that funny? I have to tell you that um, my son here, I was here, and there, we did. Uh, there was a production of high dive running in Poland and in Slovakia for months. Mm. So. They were doing me, and they sent me, they sent me a disc of it, and we watched it in, in, in Slovak. Wow. There was a band on stage on the diving board. Oh, no. It was a very different interpretation. <laughs> but we didn't understand it, so we enjoyed it. <laughs> um, do you both feel as confident as actors as you do as? I can answer that. Okay. I don't think, I think as an actor that I'm a good actor, but I don't think I'm particularly special. I think I had a modest career as an actor, and I don't think I was as hungry as an actor, and I don't think I wanted it as much. When I became a writer, I felt more myself. I liked being in control of things. And I think I do have my own voice, mm -hmm. that I am more specific, more unique as a writer than I was as an actor. And I've actually had the same thought uh, about myself, in that uh, in high school I liked to write plays, and I very much enjoyed being in them too. And I was interested in doing both, but um, I thought, I had a thought, which was I think I'm more unusual as a writer than I am as an actor. So um, mm -hmm. I, I have the same. I had the same mm -hmm. thought. That having been said, I, I like acting, and I miss it a little bit. I haven't done mm -hmm. that in a while. Yeah, I've seen you in some movies though, which I mean, you didn't write them. You just had small parts in different movies. Yes, true. I always um, go, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Well, a actually, if, if if I may, uh, uh, well, a couple things come to mind. My 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 long term. Time agent uh, who's uh, died a few um, by now, probably ten years ago. Helen Merrill, I really mm -hmm. adored her. She was wonderful, and I was lucky to have found her. Uh, rather, she found me. But um, uh, she said to me early on uh, that she she said, "Be careful." She said, I, "I wouldn't do that much acting because I think you'll confuse critics and audiences. Mm -hmm. Are you a writer or are you an actor?" So. I, I I listened to that because at the same time I was being sent on you know auditions for commercials. Oh, no. uh, I never got one, but uh, you know it could be it could be very good money. So um, so anyway, I sort of put that in my head. But then um, when my play, oh God, I, I, my story, I can see this could be long. <laughs> my play Titanic, I was not in it. Sigourney Weaver, not known yet, was in it. And uh, it got mixed but friendly reviews when it was on at 11 at night. 
and uh, a friend of ours from drama school who had some family money decided to move it to Off-Broadway, but it only was an hour and 10 minutes or something, and so we decided to do a curtain raiser. And Sigourney and I had, because of this singing class we'd been in, we had done a sort of ad hoc 20-minute version of this act together, which we eventually called Das Lusitania Songspiel. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it was a parody. It, we pretended that we were experts on Brecht and Kurt Weill, which Yale Rep did much of. And I actually loved them, but they were extremely eccentric in their writing. And their, so, so um, when we did Titanic, Sigourney and I decided to do a half-hour version of our nightclub act. Wow. And um, it was, uh, the reviews were just ghastly, especially for Titanic. And um, anyway, it was really a, a ghastly thing. And that's when my reviews were so bad, I said to my agent, will anyone ever do a play of mine again? Mm -hmm. uh, and she said, uh, yes, people can get reviews, which is mostly true. Not, not always true, but mostly true. <laughs> But um, anyway, so then I went on and had this the American film, and uh, right after the terrible reviews, and it was such a relief to go to the O'Neill, and everybody liked the play, it was a lovely experience. And then Sigourney uh, made Alien, and all of a sudden she was famous, and, um, and uh, she was friends with the people who were producing and had written Vanities, which was an off-Broadway yeah. hit, and it was, uh, and for some reason or other, I don't know how it happened, but uh, they said, oh, why don't you and Sigourney do your cabaret act at 11 o'clock at night after Vanities? And uh, there's, only, there's only one dressing room, so we would show up at 10.30 and I'd be in the dressing room with all these women. <laughs> that, that didn't, it didn't matter, but... Um, <laughs> In any case, we decided, we, we decided to do this cabaret, and we rewrote it from the, uh, from the uh, earlier version, and uh, I think made it better. And, um, oh gee, one of my friends was very worried and said, should you be doing this? Do you think it's a good idea? And um, also, so we started, the first time, the first couple performances, uh, I was a little nervous, and uh, an acquaintance, I'm not going to name, came to uh, see Sister Mary had just been done with EST and got the great reviews, and Das Lusitania was going to happen shortly afterward, and this friend came, and it, we went out for dinner, and it was like 9 o'clock, and I just had to be at the theater at 10.30, and he said, uh, is your cabaret act going to be um, reviewed? And I said, uh, yes. Yeah. And he said, gee, I think Sister Mary is so good if you can stop it being reviewed. You're not very good in it. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, uh, it was, but, so I had to, not only was it terrible, but I had to perform in like an hour. <laughs> so anyway, I had, I had an early, Sigourney and I had, had like a couple of duets at the beginning. And then I had a solo called The Young Sailor's Lesson, which... Um, it was like a parody. Yes, a parody of a Kurt, Kurt Weill song. And um, a little bit of a survey, a Johnny sort of thing. Um. So anyway, and I had to uh, uh, walk down stage. And as I was walking down stage, I thought to myself, you're not very good. <laughs> but then I thought, that is a terrible thing to say to yourself when you're on stage. And I said that sentence to myself. And, I, and then I got, for some reason, it made me giddy that I was having this conversation with myself. And I got good that night. That's great. And then we got great reviews. We got fabulous wow. reviews. And we became a sort of a cult thing. And I remember because we had. Uh, we were, it was really crackpot because we would say that Bertolt Brecht wrote uh, Barry Lyndon, the movie. Which he did. <laughs> so Barney played Marissa Berenson and I played the five year old son. And we, anyway, that was uh, then we had this thing that we said that Brecht had written um, 
Ava Perone, the demon first lady of Buenos Aires. <laughs> and we combined Sister Mary, not Sister Mary, but Sweeney Todd and Anita. And it was, I'm glad we didn't know it at the time, but Stephen Sondheim then came and laughed and laughed at it. And anyway, it was a wonderful experience. So uh, I don't remember what I was answering. But, <laughs> but that was a fun experience. Oh, I know why I said it. <laughs> Because of Das Lusitania, I started to get cast in things. Uh, not a lot, but somewhat. And then around the time I got cast in my own play, The Marriage of Bette and Boo, playing the character of Matt, and that's my one biographical play. It's about my parents' marriage and extended family. And Matt is actually me. And I did not expect to do it, but uh, in the early readings for Joe Papp, I didn't do the part. And then very weirdly, Joe Papp was famous for not seeing things outside of his own theater. But he saw me in a Young Playwrights Festival thing, and anyway, he suggested that I do it. And uh, I was scared, because I thought, oh God, what if this seems pathetic that I'm in my own play and there's a lot of sadness in it. Uh, but then I thought, I can't, Joe, Joe Papp is offering me a part in my own play. I, I, I definitely should say yes. Uh, also, he told me that I'm get I'm, what is what was Gretchen Carter's play? I'm getting my act together. Yeah, she's she's taking, taking it, it, on, it on, on the road. She wrote it, but it was Joe's idea that she play it. That she so anyway, that ended up being a, a, one of my favorite experiences ever. And I'll just tell one thing about it because I had worked with Jerry Zaks as a director about three times now. He was going to be the director, so I felt a lot of comfort with him. But he had, in the, pe in, in, in the last couple of plays, he had actually asked me to come to the first read-through as an author and then go away for a week and then come back so that he could get a rapport with the actors going. And that was fine with me because he always would listen to my comments and that's all I really wanted. But, uh, uh, however, now that I was in it, I couldn't go away for that week. <laughs> and not only that, but the first day of, maybe it was the second day because we didn't, we're not, I'm not a big, about being around the table all night, like getting up. But anyway, so did Jerry. So the second week we were probably, uh, I'm sorry, the second day we were probably, they were starting to direct it. And Matt, a different, I'm sorry, not directed, uh, mm -hmm. the movement blocking. Anyway, uh, uh, Matt had to play himself at 30 and at college, and then as a little boy. As a little boy, you don't want to do too much. You just, but uh, anyway, when, Jerry was blocking it. He said, why don't you try sitting sitting on the floor by the uh, couch? And I went, sitting on the floor? And I saw his face go, you know, you're, not, you're, you're resisting me. And, and, and I said, all, all right, okay, I'll try it. And, um, and anyway, I just, but as the day went on, there was this unspoken uh, tension. And then I thought to myself, I am getting a, an acting paycheck. And so I, I of course, have to try what he asked me. I mean, I did try it, but I, I needed to not show an initial <laughs> question, questioning of it. I, that was me, the author, thinking, hmm, is that a good idea for them? So I actually apologized to him at the end of the day, and I said, um, I'm getting an iPhone salary, and I'm sorry. I will not do that again. And then it was great. Uh, and I was very glad that I knew to apologize. Um, did that turn out to be a great act, acting experience being in that play? It, it, it was wonderful. And not only, moved, Leslie mentioned Olympia the Caucus, we had so many wonderful people, but uh, some of them gave indelible performances, Joan Allen and uh, Mercedes Rule and, uh, and Olympia, and was so wonderful in the part of Soot, uh, and that a bunch of us for the whole run would go off stage, if we were off stage, but we would all watch from the wings this one particular scene that Olympia did. Mm -hmm. It was just wonderful. The thing that was very strange about it is that it was uh, my family of origin. And of course, it's fictionalized to some degree, but there was a lot that was not. And I remember that uh, two actors said to me somewhere, I can't remember if it was in rehearsal or when they were in performance, they said there was one day where you said some line and it seemed so true, it was disturbing. <laughs> or not disturbing, but they said it just really registered. It was just so, uh, so it was really, really odd. And I also thought to myself, I'm, 
I have a feeling I seem very outgoing this weekend, and I am outgoing because that's what I feel I should be. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm shy, and if you put me at a, at a cocktail party with people who don't know who I am, I can't talk to anybody. I don't know how to make chit-chat with people. So in any case, I just thought that, how did I ever get in this play that is so uh, self-revealing? Self because in the second part, there's an awful lot about separation from parents and all that. Uh, anyway, it was very self-revealing. And Jerry, by the way, was such a wonderful director. And uh, he gave this he gave this direction, the last scene, Beth dies. It's very sad. And, uh, but Matt, who is now, uh, is now 30, which and I was like 36, was in the hospital. And boo, they were going to be divorced. But he showed up. Uh, as a visit, and Jerry's direction after we read through it once was he said, now, obviously sad, do not play the sadness. This is actually a good visit. For them, it's a good visit. There, there's, and Bet has stopped trying to change Boo, and he, she's just accepting him. And then he also gave uh, Bet and Matt had some, you know, disagreements in the scene from time to time. And he said, you know, do them pull out, but then let, let it go. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not holding on to it. It's not that. And anyway, I just found that so a wonderful direction. And then it was just a very special scene to be in. And I will just say about how uh, things can go wrong in other productions. I saw a production, it was actually the first one I saw a year after the public one had closed. and. Um, it was a, a production that never got any laughs, and the last scene, they, they had the hospital scene like it was Beckett. They were in solo, uh, whatchamacallit, spotlights, and they looked out and didn't talk to each other. It was, it was one of the worst uh, productions I've ever seen. However, the one we were in I loved, and I liked the, I liked the revival a couple of years ago as well. Um, I, I know that you guys haven't really directed your own work much. Um, is that Have you directed your own? I directed um, a one-act play that I wrote called Death Day for a deaf friend of mine, and I directed a play at the Atlantic um, called There You Are, and I think I've done others, but I can't remember. I think I have. Do you a long do time you, ago? Do you think, in general, uh, a playwright directing his or her own work is is there an advantage to it, or are there drawbacks to it? I know, for example, Edward Albee has often directed his own work, and some people think that's great, some people think you're eliminating that extra brain and, and creative input and, and right. collaborator, so I just wonder how you feel about directing work that you've written. I actually don't have the patience for it. <laughs> you tell you the truth. It's like the first day I want them to be better. <laughs> um, I have often had producers who, who say that they like my work having the extra vision of a director. And vision is too strong of a word, but the participation in it and uh, so on. And, um, also, I think um, I, the times I've directed, I'll tell you, when I directed a play not by me at the Young Playwrights Festival, I really enjoyed it, mm -hmm. except for the fact that I didn't have breathing time. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, uh, on the break, everybody comes up to you, the set designer comes up, and it, it's really hard. And as the playwright you get to, I never smoked, but I, so I didn't go out for a smoke, but I went out for coffee or to take a walk or just <coughs> have a break. Um, and. Um, then the other thing, hopefully I forgot where I was going. I will say though that um, if I see something that's horribly directed, I will sometimes wish I had directed yeah. it or something right. like yeah. that. But I have enjoyed working with directors. For me, I, I really need the director to be open to listening to my thoughts. Uh, and with a couple of the directors, I the first director I worked with at Yale was a lot of fun, and he just let everybody talk anytime they wanted to. The actors, me, anything. And it was, matter of fact, 
he was so loose about it once uh, we had a professional production of his American film at the Marquette Before him when he was still very young and I was very young. And the actress was not understanding the section where Loretta turns into Martha from Virginia Woolf. And he talked to her and he, 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 he she, she just couldn't get it. And I said to her, well, Peter, would, would, will you talk to her some more? And, and blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, why don't you talk to her? I, I can't seem to get through to her. And on the one hand, I thought it was nice of him. On the other hand, I thought, oh, you're giving up. And then I, I tried and I couldn't get through. <laughs> she, she, wasn't, she wasn't being difficult. She, and I guess she'd seen Virginia Woolf. She just didn't get how to put it in. It didn't matter, though, because it was a brief part of the, the play, and she was very good at the, the, the bulk of it. Um, but anyway, so mostly I've not liked to. Oh, I, just one more thing, though, about I know what I wanted to say. And Leslie said she wants the actors to get there right away. If I were to direct more, I would have to control myself about wanting results. I really like them to get it right. Well, let me put it a different way. Many of my, the actors get it right at the first read through. They just yeah. know how to do it. And then what happens is the second week they start to doubt it. Yes. And they try to change yes. it and get it more. Right. And the people who are good directors, I feel, Tolerate that. Tolerate it. And let it, <laughs> and, 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 and try to get it. No, it's really true. No, it's true. And, and I, I have one example I just wanted to give. My play, Miss Witherspoon, was directed by Emily Mann and Carter, and I, Emily's a lovely person. I really like her, and she's the director. And there was this uh, character, this actress who, who was fabulous. She got it, uh, it, was not, it wasn't Miss Witherspoon, it was uh, another part of the play. And she got it with her audition, and she just, and at some point she announced in rehearsal, like a week and a half in, that she wanted to play it a different way. She didn't like this particular way of doing it. And the way she did it made it not work. It simply didn't work. And, and I, I went as, uh, oh, I, I just, it was painful. And it was also sort of late in the play, and I thought, if she doesn't change, can I rewrite it in some way? And I couldn't. <laughs> it was, what she had to say was integral to what happened to the yeah. ending. So I, I went aside to Emily again. Uh, I wouldn't say this out loud anyway, but I said, um, are we in agreement that it can't work this way? And she said, yes, yes, it can't work this way. And I said, and do you think you'll be able to get her back? And she said, yes, I do, but I think it'll take two or three days. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to go home for three days. <laughs> because it'll give me an ulcer. But, uh, but I'll come back. Uh, and, and I came back, and she was back. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, kudos to uh, Emily for knowing how to do that. You know, one of the things that I think that I struggle with as a director is that I have a very definite rhythm in my head of how the actors speak. So that I can tell that if, if actors are not hitting a certain word in a sentence, like that one word, I know that one word will just change everything. You just hit that one word, so I'm like, yeah. Like you come to the center, you can tell that I'm tense, which isn't helpful for them. And, and I, I also think that I'm, I'm inclined to give line readings, which, do, yeah. which people say they don't want. So bad. Uh, but I have to say that I, I know that Rich told me, Rich Greenberg told me that when they were in rehearsal for uh, Take Me Out, that Joe Mantello had just the, the greatest finesse because he's an actor, director. Okay. And Joe, in this really conversational way, was able to talk to an actor and drop the line reading right in and keep going. <laughs> he just had a yeah. way to do that, which is much different than me saying, no, no, just say it like this. You know, so, yeah, so there is a way to do that, which I don't trust that I'm, 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 I don't have his finesse. He's, he's really excellent at that point. And anyway. Um, I have a lot more questions, but I know you guys do too. We don't have too much time, so would anyone like to ask questions on this subject? Yes. As a playwright, what are the most important elements you feel a director brings to the production? Could or should bring to the production? Um, you know, Mike Nichols is famous for saying that 90% uh, of casting is, is I'm right. sorry, direction is casting. casting. And uh, the casting is, first of all, the playwright and the director are always there together if it's a, if it's a first production. Or, and um, it's a one way of finding out that you're in sync if you're liking the same people. And I've almost always liked the same people, not 
as the director. I've just been lucky that way. Every so often, not. But um, so the casting is almost the most important thing. And I've had a few times, well, twice, where we had to fire people. And it's always the director who has to do it. And it's always traumatizing for everybody. Um, but it was really necessary. And then the third time, at the first reading, I saw we made an enormous mistake. And I went to the director and to the producer and said, I've been down this route before. He's not going to be able to get it. It's better to replace him right now. And neither of them have agreed with me. Mm -hmm. And I was just stuck. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I really did my best to help the actor and, uh, very genuinely. And he never, ever could get it. Luckily, he wasn't the lead, but it, was, uh, it wasn't a great experience. And, and then, uh, gee, what else would you say you look well, for in a director? I'm just always impressed by the process of having the characters come into the characters, how the actors grow inside the, how they're gently guided to understand beat for beat for beat what the play is about. So I'm really interested in directors that actually divide the play into beats so that we really do understand that this story, this larger story, is being told in these small ways all the way through and that each one is clear. And I know that some directors work in a way of actually making sure a beat is clear before it moves on. And um, that can be very effective to happen. But you make sure that the story is being told and that it isn't, isn't vague in some way. And I know that stories can be interpreted in lots of different ways, but we do come at it wanting to make a point. And it's nice when you sense that you agree on what that is. And, and also, the aesthetic of a, of a play, I don't, I'm not always confident about. I'm not always confident that I understand how my actors should dress. I, I'm not always confident that I understand what the set is. I do know when the set is wrong. I can, I can tell. One of, one of my plays, Nine Indians, was actually, for some reason, the set was an ark. It was really, it was a boat, which had, I never understood that. <laughs> it really was, it was just a round wall like that. And it was done by a very famous New York designer, so it was confusing to me. But I didn't have enough confidence in my own aesthetic to say, I don't know, is this set right? So it's, it's, it's nice when you have a director that you can trust his or her aesthetic, that it's going to look right. I have a much better sense about lighting. I know what kind of lighting I want and don't want, and I really weigh in on that. I can't tell when things are wrong. I can't always say why it needs to be different. I, I sometimes get boggles, and so I don't, I, I really appreciate directors who can help me figure out why this is right. Um, I think we have another session coming up, so is there one more real quick question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Time frame between your works, when you start getting that on paper to finally getting it up on stage, it's the average. Oh, wow. I don't know if there's an average, actually. Right. Um, 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 it, I'll tell you, it's faster than a play gets up faster than a musical, and mm -hmm. uh, a movie can take <laughs> anywhere Sorry. from two years to 20 years. <laughs> Um, so I would say uh, I write a play, and then if it's up in a year, that's good. Wow, that is good. Um, I would agree. And it sometimes can be. And then sometimes it's also, I, I've discovered, I, it feels to me like the regional theaters have started making their following season earlier yeah, than they yeah, used to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That it used to be if you got them a play in January or maybe even March, they might consider it. And um, Matter of fact, my play "Why Torture Is Wrong" um, and the people who love them um, were, uh, got in got into the public quickly because they lost the play. So otherwise, it would have been a full year later. Um, I just want to say thank you. I hope that you both will still act in your own work because I'd love to see you on stage. Thank well, you. Thank you. I will. <laughs>
from four to five, and that is commissions and submissions, and we've got quite a panel for that, a few local artistic directors, as well as Christian joining us again, um, our representatives from Samuel French, and we'll really be talking about when playwrights submit their work, when they're commissioned to do work, and some of the intricacies of that. So um, I'll say just as a reminder to uh, stop at the desk out in the lobby to get your parking um, validated with the pink sticker. Um, and if you have people coming in tonight as guests, um, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, we have to have an adjustment. So 